Um, this morning, we have Ray Klapowski, I have the honor of introducing. He is um, one of my partners in the Fracture Clinic. Uh, Ray is a, a great clinician. He's an avid Dallas Cowboys fan. We actually uh, stole him or, or recruited him out of CHOP and brought him down to Dallas. And he just wanted to be closer to these Cowboys, so we're really happy he's here. Uh, Ray is a great clinician, like I said, but he's also a phenomenal speaker. Ray has over 90 national podium presentations. I think that's really where his passion lies, so I think you guys are in for a real treat this morning. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn this mic over to Ray. Today we're going to talk about adolescent and pediatric ankle injuries. I'm going to answer the questions that most people have. And for the pediatricians out there, the biggest question is, when do we send them? When do we get x-rays? What do we do? How do we do it? Um, and I'm going to try to answer most of those questions for you today, and you may still have questions after. Um, and we're, so we're going to start with a didactic lecture and then go on to a physical exam that we have a great volunteer for. I have no disclosures. These are my objectives. So when we examine an ankle, I would ask you guys to stay consistent with the way you examine. D despite the patient, despite the size of the patient, the age of the patient, if you stay consistent, you'll get the same exam every time. And I would venture to say that the best thing to do is try to examine the other side first. You want to see what a norm looks like on a child so you can determine abnormality. Um, the other thing you have to consider is that we're addressing patients who may not want to be touched. Right? Because one, they're children. Two, we're scary. Three, they're hurt. So, and we all know this already, you go to the injured part last. If you go to the injured part first, you've lost all the trust possible in that exam, and you're not going to get anything else. So try to dance around it and um, be systematic. Examine proximal to distal and try to go to the most injured part last, or what you assume is the most injured part. Observe first. Just look globally at what you're seeing. Do you see swelling? Do you see blood? Do you see deformity? Do you see nothing? And then start your palpation and then uh, proceed to your provocative test. Now we're going to go over palpation with anatomic uh, outlines on our model as well as the provocative tests. And then observe the patient. First, gait. Can they or can't they walk? Okay. If they can't walk, you don't have to make them walk. Please try not to make them walk. Um, look at how their foot progresses if they're walking. Evaluate the lower extremity. So this is really important. When you're examining a patient for a lower extremity, they need to be in at least pants pulled up above their knees, preferably shorts. Because we want to be able to see the entire kinetic chain from hip down to foot. Evaluate the hip, knee, ankle, and foot separately. Contralaterally first, and then the affected side. And then look for a limp. Describe the limp if you can. Um, many times these patients may not be able to walk. Look for atrophy, look for shape. Not necessarily for an acute injury, but all in all looking at the overall alignment and shape of the extremity. So looking at pediatric ankle fractures, first we need to talk about the anatomy of the ankle. Uh, when we'll touch base on this when I do my walkthrough of the exam. But in short, when we look at an ankle, and this is throughout the body, ligaments attach bone to bone. So the ligaments attached to the epiphysis, this is the medial portion of the ankle, so this is the distal tibia, and this is the deltoid ligament. So they attach bone to bone. Ligaments are stronger than the growth plates. So typically, for most of the injuries that we see, the growth plate, for the younger kids, the growth plate's gonna be the part that get injured. For the older kids, it may actually be soft tissue or sprains. The growth plate will fail first because biomechanically, it's weaker. When I talk to families about this, I try to use it in terms of building material. So I would say bone is like brick, growth plates are sort of like wet mortar. So they're a bit sticky, but they can move a lot easier. Ligaments and tendons I compare to very strong cables. That helps them understand it a bit better. So. First thing we do, after we've evaluated systematically, looked at their gait, systematically looked at what we could, start your palpation. Now, you can start your palpation from wherever you want, but try to be systematic about palpating that way every time. If m most ankle injuries 
probably about 75 to 80 percent of them or more are lateral. So you want to try to palpate lateral last. And you come anterior first. So anterior, the first things we think about is an OCD of the talus or the cartilage injury of the talus. Also, right here at the top of the foot. Now, I'd be remiss to not have to talk about a foot exam when we talk about the ankle because a lot of ankle injuries and a lot of inversion or eversion injuries can actually uh, be top of foot injuries rather than ankle. So they're not mutually exclusive diagnoses. So here at the anterior portion of the anterior dorsal portion of the navicular, you can get a navicular strain here, a capsular strain. Also, if you palpate a little bit lower, you can find a Liz Frank injury. Liz Frank injuries are beyond the scope of this talk, but always be thinking about foot injuries when you're looking at the ankle as well. And then I try to go medial or lateral. And then laterally, we look at the topographic anatomy, and you have the distal fibula. You can get a sort of the edge of the distal tibia, the anterior tibiofibular ligament, uh, the uh, anterior talofibular ligament, and the calcaneofibular ligament, as well as the posterior talofibular ligament. And then back here is the perineal tendon connecting to the fifth metatarsal. So any, with an inversion injury, any one of these can actually be injured. And the most common injuries we see are Salter Harris fractures of the distal tibia, fibula, I'm sorry, anterior lateral ankle sprains, lateral ankle fractures, perineal tendonitis, fifth metatarsal fractures, or overuse conditions of the fifth metatarsal. And those are your top six injuries you're going to see out on that uh, lateral portion of the ankle. And then we turn our attention medially, <clears throat> and uh, the, the biggest issues here are possible deltoid sprain, medial malleolar fractures, or growth bite fractures of the distal tibia, posterior tibialis tendonitis, and then also, again, thinking about the feet, and I see an inordinate amount of accessory navicular is even in fracture clinic because people come in saying I have a foot fracture and a bump on the inside of my foot. Not a fracture, but this actually can be fairly symptomatic um, and require sometimes immobilization. So sometimes these patients actually present as possible fractures or foot injuries when in, in fact it's a long-term diagnosis. And then turn your attention posteriorly if you can. And again, you can be doing posterior if you're, anterior, uh, if you're lateral or medial at the same time. So posteriorly, you have your calcaneus. So you could have a calcaneal fracture, um, usually a high impact type injury. Seaver's disease, now Seaver's disease or calcaneal apophysitis can project anywhere on the calcaneus. It could be medial, it could be lateral, it could be posterior. Um, and then also Achilles tendonitis. So radiographs, big question in the community. Which ones do we get? How do I get them? So I would say the best, pot, best bang for your buck for an ankle is an AP lateral or mortis view of the ankle. That's all we really need in orthopedics. Um, I would urge people in the outpatient setting to try to get their ankle at 90 degrees. Um, and I'll show you why in the next slide. Most patients, when they get injured in their ankle, they're going to go to the position of comfort, which is basically plantar flex in the ankle about 10 to 20 degrees, maybe because it's swollen, maybe because they do not want to dorsiflex and hold it in neutral. And I prefer, or we prefer, weight bearing if possible. Now, that's not always possible with your injuries, especially if they have bad ankle injuries. So these are the most common uh, images that you'll see an AP of the ankle here, a mortis so we can see into the ankle joint. That, about, allows us to evaluate the tibor dome and to see if there's any type of osteochondral or chondral defects in that area, and then a good lateral. And I'll repeat that because it bears repeating. A good lateral. Um, and the reason is if you get a bit rotated on an ankle, you'll see in the next slide, it can change your entire diagnosis. And we don't expect out in the community that you know, you're going to be able to get them to weight bear, you're going to be able to get them to 90, as, but as close to 90 as possible, getting good x-rays really does uh, give us a lot more information. So, a tale of two films. Good lateral, more of an oblique of the ankle. So we see this, and it, it, you know, looking here, it looks like there could be a fracture, 
looks like there could be an ankle dislocation. You really can tell, but when we get that patient down to a lateral, you see that they actually have a Salter Harris II of the distal tibia with mild displacement right here. Not really detected here because of the rotation of the film. So what this does, it requires us to get further images, increases the amount of radiation and cost to the family and to the patient. So we urge to try to get the best possible images. Now, if they can't weight bear, you can do what's called modified weight bearing, get them at 90 degrees on a tabletop and just have the radiology tech push a, uh, a plate up against their foot and just try to get them as close to 90 as possible. So here's the big question. Do they need x-rays? And this is a controversy that goes out throughout our um, organization, and not really our organization, but more of our profession. So the auto ankle rules developed back in 94 basically say that an ankle series is only required if there's pain in the malleolar zone, medial or lateral or medial, bone tenderness at the distal six centimeters of the fibula or the distal six centimeters of the tibia. Um, and then to the edge of the tibia or fibula. And then if there's any tenderness to palpation at the base of the fifth metatarsal or the navicular. So tenderness at A, this is A here, tenderness at B, or inability to weight bear both immediately and up to four hours after presentation. Now these ankle rules were really developed for emergency room physicians to make determinations on what patients need x-rays and what patients don't. Several studies support that the Ottawa ankle rule, rules in kids are 98.5% effective over six years of age. Six years of age and younger, it's a little bit less predictable. So there was a physician in 2013 out of Canada by the name of Kathy Buidis, who is an emergency room physician, who basically said that Ottawa ankle rules are 100% sensitive and 40% specific in adults over age 18, but use caution when applied to children. She basically, her paper, which was landmark at the time, said if a child has a low risk exam, which basically means tenderness at the distal fibula or the adjacent lateral ligaments to the anterior tibial joint line here, that x-rays are not needed. She basically delineated that lateral ankle sprains, Salter Harris one and two fractures of the distal fibula and distal fibula and lateral uh, talus avulsion injuries did not need x-rays. And I don't necessarily agree with that paper, and I will tell you why. And if you look at these images here, so we have a Salter Harris one of the distal, tibia, distal fibula here. Diagnosis is made by clinical exam. Salter Harris two of the distal fibula here. Diagnosis is made by x-ray and clinical exam. An avulsion injury of the distal fibula. Now here's where it gets a bit sticky. This is also an avulsive injury of the distal fibula, but this can be a bad actor. And sometimes these actual injuries can require surgical intervention. So I would say that most patients that have any bony tenderness, I, I sort of follow the Ottawa ankle rules even for children, any bony tenderness at the distal tibia or distal fibula, navicular, fifth metatarsal, should, should get x-rays. If you truly have an exam that shows soft tissue pain only, and your confidence level is pretty high that you believe that's a sprain, you could likely forego x-rays, um, but you have to be very specific that there's no pain anywhere at the bones. So bimalleolar fractures, distal tibia, distal fibular fractures, up to 40% of all injuries in skeletally immature children. Second most common injury in children to distal radius fractures, which are the most common and typically happen between the ages of eight and 13. So going back to the Ottawa ankle rules, which basically said that they were ineffective under age six, I really believe that with this age group, I'm gonna do more x-rays than less. So Salter Harris uh, fractures, classification of growth plate fractures from one to five. So Salter Harris one is a, typically, if, unless it's displaced, is a diagnosis made by clinical exam. X-rays will typically be normal, or there could be some mild widening of the growth plate right here. Salter Harris II, what happens to be the most common Salter Harris classification we see, is through the growth plate and up into the metaphysis of the bone there. 
Those are the two fairly good actors. They can be bad actors if they're displaced. The bad actors come at three, four, and five. Three goes across the growth plate and enters through and into the joint. Four goes across all. And five, the growth plate is crushed. I've been doing pediatric orthopedics for close to 20 years, and I have yet to see a five. I know they're out there. I've heard of them. I've seen pictures of them, but I've never seen one myself, thank God, because it's a pretty traumatic injury. Uh, focal tenderness for Salter Harris 1, your clinical exam is going to be focal tenderness at the distal fibula, right there at the growth plate. Uh, localized soft tissue swelling, that's a plus minus. If the kid shows up to you seven, eight, nine days later, they may not have any swelling at all. They may be, they may be able to weight bear on this ankle, but it will be gingerly and with limping. So comparing a growth plate fracture versus a sprain, because they happen in a very small area across from each other. So a sprain, you're going to have pain over the ligaments. Now, you can have both, too. There, you can have a Salter Harris fracture and a sprain at the same time. And I'll, my treatment's basically about the same. So with a sprain, you're going to have pain over the ligament. There could or may, there may or may not be ecchymosis. There's usually swelling. Um, it could be fairly significant swelling with high-level sprains. Um, and it, plus or minus tail or tilt, plus or minus anterior drawer from grade one to three. And we'll talk a bit more about this. Fractures are going to be a bit different. For fractures, we're going to have pain over the bone more, typically at the distal tibia or fibular uh, medial or lateral malleolus or the growth plates. And the patient may or may not have difficulty weight bearing. Salter Harris 2s are much more common than Salter Harris 1s. The strength of the physis is weaker than the bone surrounding it. So when we're examining, where do fractures hurt? Where do sprains hurt? A fracture will hurt right here at the distal fibular growth plate area, right there. And a sprain will hurt here in the soft tissue. So that's pretty telltale exam. So when we talk about sprains, we talk about grading of sprains. And typically when I'm talking to my patients, because they, they really use the word just in front of sprain. I'm sure you guys have all heard that. Oh, it's just a sprain. I'll be fine in two days, because that's what they told me. I really try to avoid using the word just in front of sprain, because sprains can be fairly significant injuries, especially if they're grade three, and may require a prolonged immobilization and prolonged rehab. So they say, oh, well, we're, we're happy it's not broken. It's not fractured. It's just a sprain. So, yeah, it's a grade three sprain, though. So when I talk to my families, when I talk about sprains, because they, I think the, the, the commonality in the environment the outside is sprains are no big deal. Um, and when I tell them a sprain is a tear of a ligament, as soon as they hear the word tear, it actually changes their dynamic of how they talk. So when I say to families, a sprain, imagine you have a sweater. And a grade one sprain is like this. And a grade two sprain is a bit more torn. And this is a grade three. And you can see their faces change during the exam. Oh, well, that's a sprain too? Yes. It's a sprain. It's just a much worse sprain. So grade one sprains, mild to moderate. Partial tear of the ATFL, but the calcaneal fibular ligament remains intact. Grade two, moderate to severe swelling. Maybe more ecchymosis, maybe more swelling, and may have more instability. ATFL, the anterior talus fibular ligament, is completely torn, and the calcaneal fibular ligament may have some mild tearing plus or minus, usually have an anterior drawer, and we'll just demonstrate that test a bit later. And then grade three, severe sprain, significant swelling, obvious instability, greater than 10 millimeters of translation with the anterior drawer, complete tear of both the ATFL and the calcaneal fibrillar ligament, and they will have a positive anterior drawer and a positive tower tilt. So how do we treat these? Casts, boots, nothing, everything. So um, Dr. Ellis and Dr. Beck um, have a manuscript out, and they've reached out to uh, a plethora of pediatric orthopedic surgeons to ask them how they treat. And if you see here, I know this is a pretty busy slide, but I wanted to sort of outline here that you see most of us are treating these in boots, whether they be wee walkers for younger kids or cam boots um, for sprains, 
uh, or for fractures and some for sprains. And I would tell you, if you just look at this slide, and this is available for you guys to see outside as well, the, the take home message on this slide is there's significant variability in treatment, and none of us really subscribe to one type of treatment. Um, you can see, luckily, not too many people are just doing nothing. Kind of dig that, that we're actually treating these somehow. So significant uh, variability in, exists in the primary treatment of immobilization for lateral ankle injuries combined. That's sprains and fractures. I tailor my treatment to each individual patient, taking into account age, sport, time of injury, fracture or sprain pattern. But most times, I do personally prefer uh, using a boot. Now, grade one and two sprains, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, because they released another uh, manuscript recently, and basically complications related to lateral ankle injuries. Keen boot was most commonly immobilized for both ankle sprains and Salter Harris fractures with bracing and casting second. When treating Salter Harris 1 fractures, the cast complication was 9.6% versus a boot being 0.4%. So almost a 10 time increase in complications related to casting. And that's all types of cast, uh, regular short leg, long leg, waterproof, non-waterproof. So the conclusion on this is increased complications with cast treatment were noted in both groups. So it begs the question of how do we treat these? Cast, brace, boot, nothing. Therapy versus HEP. So my feeling is Salter Harris 1, Salter Harris 2 fractures, and grade 2 sprains, I like to treat in a boot. And the way I do, <clears throat> excuse me, Salter Harris 1 and 2 fractures is a boot for about four to five weeks. Boot remains on full time. It can be taken off for showering and bathing. Grade 2 sprains, I typically boot for about two weeks. I also place these kids on anti-inflammatories, and I bring them back in two weeks to take a look at them and start them on an early aggressive home exercise program. Brace-wise, I do braces for Salter, I'm sorry, um, for grade 1 and grade 2 ankles ankle sprains if they're fairly stable. Now, the controversy is, even though you looked at the last two manuscripts, for grade three ankle sprains, I may cast for about 10 days to three weeks just to stiffen that ankle up and get them better ready for rehab. And that's variable. Not everybody does that. Some people will treat in a boot. I will tell you grade three ankle sprains are fairly unstable, and they feel a lot better in a cast, even if it's for about 10 days, just to sort of lock them down and let the healing start. Nothing, um, I'm not really, I'm still not at the point where I'm doing nothing. And then I'm going to lean on my therapy folks when we start having questions and answers to, for you guys to give me like a five minute, what do you do when we send them to you? Because typically for my sentinel events, my first ankle sprains and less serious injuries, I try not to send these patients to physical therapy unless they're high grade ankle sprains. I give them a home exercise program, with open and closed chain strengthening, proprioception, and progression back to sports as tolerated after about one to two weeks of uh, home exercise programs. We all know, because you're out here, that what is said is listened to about 50% of the time, maybe. Uh, so if I ask them to do their ankle program two to three times a day, I might get two to three times, period, not a day period in the, in the two weeks, and they may or may not come back saying they still have pain, they still have weakness. So I really encourage them to do the home exercise program. Subsequent injuries, when I have patients who have a secondary, tertiary, four or five, you, you may see the patient says, well, I sprain my ankle every time I get on the basketball court, and that's why I wear these braces. And I have to show up to basketball 20 minutes before to put my braces on, and despite these braces, I'm still spraining my ankles. Okay, well, you have an unstable ankle. Let's get you to therapy and get you strengthened. So I do recommend formal PT for those types of patients. And I also recommend if my sentinel event and less serious events don't do their home exercise program and they come back with some pain or instability, I'll, I'll try to get them to formal PT as well. Um, and they can also work with their trainer. And we give them a home exercise program with a TheraBand. And I really leave it to the trainer to sort of expand upon that home exercise program. Ours is fairly basic. It's just strengthening, stretching, proprioception, and some light activities to get back to normal activity with the assistance of the trainer. And I'm sure 
the ATCs and the PTs out in the, out in the audience in the community are going to have responses to that, and I, I welcome them. I want to hear what you guys do, because we don't see it on the back end as a clinician until they've either failed or didn't do it or didn't show up to PT four or five times and I get a letter saying that they've been discharged from PT. So now we're going to jump to the higher end fractures. These are the patients who may show up to your clinic, to your office, to your, the athletic trainer with a gigantic swollen ankle that they can't walk on and may actually look deformed. 5% of pediatric fractures, 15% of all physio injuries occur around the ankle. Peak incidence around 8 to 15 years of age. Complications from bad ankle injuries untreated are arthrosis, possible leg length discrepancy from a growth plate injury, angular deformities, or joint stiffness. So we take all of these seriously. And if you look at this fracture pattern here, you can see a Salter Harris 3 of the distal tibia and then a distal fibular fracture. And some of our notes may come to you guys and you see names like Weber or supination external rotation or Log Hansen about how we describe things. Every one of our classifications basically helps us describe the actual injury. So Log Hansen des describes the actual mechanism and Weber describes the focus on the stability of the synosmosis, the soft tissue between the tibia and fibula. So type A is below um, the synosmosis, type B, which tends to be the more and most common, is transynosmosis, and then type C is above the soft tissue. And then Log Hansen, there are multiple types of injuries. The one that we're going to focus on is the one you guys may present, may present to you the most, is the supination external rotation injury, or the SER. So, in the Log Hansen, you can see that there's multiple types of injuries, but the one I want to focus on here is the supination external rotation injury. And how this happens is there's an external rotation force that leads to a distal tibia Salter Harris II fracture and a distal fragment displaced posteriorly. This is easily visible on x rays, and actually, obviously, all these kids will get x rays. And then that's a grade one. A grade two, there's a further rotation of the ankle, and then you wind up breaking through the fibula. And this is a Weber B. Now, what I want to sort of show you this there's an anterior tibial fibular ligament sprain here that you can't see on x ray, and a short fibular, this is a Weber B, so it's through the synosmosis, rupture of the posterior complexes, and then medial malleolar disruption. So, this is the patient that will say, I twisted my ankle and I heard two pops or three pops, or my ankle turned around backwards and came back. They have all different kinds of descriptions for it. So for typical Salter Harris ones and ankle sprains, they, you may just hear, okay, um, I twisted my ankle. So the one thing that we want to be sure whenever you're examining these patients, always come up the fibula and palpate the proximal fibula for this very, very scary injury right here. Uh, called a Mason New type fracture. That's a supination external rotation injury that travels all the way up the synosmosis and comes out the proximal fibula. This is a, a surgical, big bad injury, um, and these patients will have a ton of swelling. So whenever you're, you're examining, make sure you examine the top of the fibula as well. And then we're going to finalize with the uh, triplanar to low fractures, which are called transitional fractures. These are fractures that ha happen to end or happen to be. Um, happen at the end of growth, so later adolescence. The mechanism of injury is external rotation applied to an asymmetrically closing growth plate. So when a growth plate of the distal fibula closes, it closes in the middle, and then medial, and then lateral. So when an external rotation force is applied upon here, the anterior tibiofibular ligament tears the epiphysis this way. So the physis for females close around 12 to 13, Males around 13 to 14. So there's two types of transitional fractures. There's a tilo and a triplane. And their mechanism of injury is the same, but their pathology is different. So the tilo, as you can see here, is a vulst here um, and typically happens in 12 to 14 year old males and females. Um, and you get a, a Salter Harris III fracture of the distal tibia. Now, if this space is greater than two millimeters, that patient may need surgery. Triplane, very similar mechanism of injury, 
Um, same age group, twisting eversion. So it's a difference because there's three different planes of injury. So on the AP, it's a Salter Harris 3. On the lateral, it's a Salter Harris 2 or a Salter Harris 4. And the fibular fracture can actually occur up to 50% of the time. So the question is, how do we treat these? Basically, what we try to do in clinic is treat them by reducing them in a cast, internally rotating the foot, and then sending them for a CAT scan. If the space here is greater than two millimeters, even after reduction, they'll require an open reduction internal fixation. And to end this, we're going to talk about, it's, it, again, I'd be remiss to not have to at least talk about the top of the foot when we talk about an ankle because of the type of injuries that occur here. So this is a tail of four toes. Inversion injuries for each one of these. So the apophysis or the growth center at the base of the fifth metatarsal, you can get an Island's apophysitis. This is typically a patient who's going to present with pain, but not specifically an injury. This is basically like the Oshkosh schlatters of the foot. You could have the same type of injury, except they had an inversion, and they actually avulsed that a small amount, and this is a fracture. This is a bit different. This is a tuberosity avulsion fracture that enters into the joint and then the dreaded Jones fracture that you've probably all heard about. And uh, that is a bloodshed area for the bone, so that takes a bit longer to heal. So you can see that these all presented with fifth metatarsal base pain. And you can see the difference between the four is night and day. So for the Jones fractures, we're a bit more aggressive, a limited blood supply. There's a higher risk of non-union. So our first primary treatment is to treat them in a non-weight bearing cast for six to eight weeks and then have them come back. Now, you hear about Jones fractures in the NFL, and those guys have surgery the next day. It's adults typically tend not to heal these injuries, plus those guys are under contract. So the 12 to 16 weeks to heal doesn't sound like a good idea. Um, we see these in high-level athletes. Now, the difference between the Jones and the tuberosity of uh, fracture here is about less than a centimeter. But these guys do well basically with a cast or a boot for about, three to, for about four to six weeks. So what do we know about ankle injuries in the pediatric athlete? Majority of them do well. Most deserve at least long-term follow-up, especially the growth plate injuries. And intraarticular or fractures that enter into the joint, growth plate fractures, some are operative, some are non-operative. We'll try non-operative whenever safe and effective for the patient. Long leg cast versus short leg cast, it's a really a, a, a call. It's a, it's a, um, a dealer's choice on some of them. Uh, for really displaced fractures, it's going to be long leg so you can prevent the, uh, the knee from rotating. And then weight-bearing versus non-weight-bearing depends on the fracture pattern. So basically, what I'm going to show you today is the common exam for a pediatric ankle. And Blake has been so kind to let us draw on his ankle. So you have topographical anatomy. I don't suggest you do this at every visit, but it would be pretty cool, OK? So in an exam, <clears throat> When I'm talking to a patient, basically I'll say, so Blake, tell me why you're here today. Um, I broke my ankle on a trampoline. Blake broke his ankle on a trampoline. He already knows that, right? Why does he know that? Because he's smart, right? <clears throat> and that's what he was told. All he knows is I twisted my ankle on a trampoline and it's probably broken, okay? How did that happen? What were you doing at the time? <coughs> Playing with my sister. Were you doing any flips? Yeah. Yes. So you're just doing flips on a trampoline. It's fun, right? So try to gain the report of your patient. So I saw Blake walk in. I took a look at how he walked. You know, he's, he's not going to limp. We actually had to try him limp yesterday, and it looked more like... Uh, like he may have had a neurologic disorder. So we decided not to <laughs> allow Blake to walk because we didn't want to confuse you guys. We tried to teach him a limp. It's really not easy to teach a limp if you don't have to do it. So we're just going to start. So I basically look and examine. He's got shorts on, which really, really helps me tremendously. If the patient doesn't wear him wear shorts, if you can just roll the pants up to above here so we can see the knees and you can sort of assess the, the quads, the femur. And then we go right into the exam. So I'm going to take your shoes off if you don't mind, OK? So it's important to have the shoes off, too, and socks off so you can actually see the feet. And we go right into our exam. And then when we examine, you talk to the patient. You look, start palpating. And I typically palpate the proximal tibia. Any pain there? 
And remember, for that Mason new injury I told you about, what typically wouldn't happen in a kid Blake's age, proximal fibula, any pain? Okay. And then I'll palpate down the fibula, palpate down the tibia, feel the back of the calf for any swelling, pain, heat, redness, just to make sure we're not missing something else. And then you start coming down to the ankle. And remember, I told you I like to examine anteriorly first. So I come down here, and I can hit the, the distal tibial physis right here. So if he has pain there, it may very well be a Salter-Harris fracture or a growth plate fracture of the distal tibia. Then I can come down here right between the tibia and the navicular, and that's the anterior ankle joint. And if the patient has pain here and some swelling, there could be a possibility of a cartilaginous defect in the ankle there. Um, and then while we're there, we can also come down right here to the navicular, and you can palpate for a possible capsular strain, and then your hand can bring you down here just to make sure there's no foot pain at the Liz Frank joint, and you can extend down the foot. And then because I'm already anterior, what I would typically do is go lateral. And then laterally, we come down, palpate the distal fibula here, and then the synosmosis. So if you squeeze the synosmosis here, any pain? Okay. Synosmosis squeeze test could be indicative of a high ankle sprain or a worsening injury if you have a really bad supination external rotation injury or a mason new in an older child. Then we can come down here, say there's no pain here. Does that hurt there? Okay. So Blake has pain along the distal fibular physis. So right away, I'm already thinking he may have a growth plate injury. So the distal fibular physis is localized just about a centimeter and a half above the tip of the distal fibula. And then while we're there, we can come to the anterior tibial fibular ligament, palpate there, see if he has any pain. Um, and then while we're down here, palpate the distal tip of the fibula. Any pain here could be indicative of an, uh, an avulsion injury off the distal fibula. And then we get to the lateral ankle ligaments. Okay. The anterior tibial fibular ligament, palpate there. Ankle sprain, calcaneal fibular ligament, palpate there. Possible sprain, and then posterior tibial fibular ligament, palpate there. While you're out here, you can also palpate the, uh, the perineal tendon, palpate along there. Any pain along there could be indicative of perineal tendonitis. And that perineal tendon leads right down to the fifth metatarsal base. And you palpate there, and the patient, if he has any pain there, it may be one of the four toe injuries that I told you about. Now, typically, the Jones injury is going to hurt a bit more distal right there. But because the injury is so painful, the patient may not be able to delineate between a base versus a Jones. So that's your anterior and lateral ankle ligament exam. Now, for illustration purposes, we drew the medial here. Typically, you wouldn't try to examine the medial side on the other side, but for the camera, this works much better. <clears throat> so we come down medial, <clears throat> and we get to the distal tibia, palpate along here, and then you get the distal tibial physis again. Then your posterior tibialis tendon, you could palpate as well here. If you have that, you may have tendonitis. And that tends to lead right down here to the foot, where you may have an accessory navicular. Coming back up to the distal part of the tibia here, palpating here could indicate a distal tibial avulsion fracture, and then right here, the deltoid ligament. And you can also capture, if you're medial, you can also capture your navicular here. And then, again, for illustration's sake, we're just going to roll him this way. And then posterior, you can palpate down along the Achilles tendon for any Achilles tendonitis. And then along here, anywhere in the calcaneus, if you squeeze and they have pain, there's a possibility of Seaver's apophysitis. So those are sort of the most common palpation areas and what we expect with each one of those. Now, the patient can have pain in all of those and sometimes happens. 
So it's important to, uh, when, I, when I talk to patients, because you may not have the most, um, the greatest historian, let's call them. They tend not to be the greatest historian. So the one thing I like to do, and especially if you start palpating with a younger child, they'll look down. And when they look down, they say, yes, that hurts. So I do a little bit of a cover test here, and then I say, okay, I'm going to give something a number, one and two, okay? This is number one, distal fibular physis, and then I go right to the ATFL, because that's the most common sprain. What hurts more, one or two? And then I'll come around to another couple body parts. So I'll go to distal tibial physis. It hurts num more, number one or two. And when I sort of get an average of, okay, we're hurting right here, and I have normal x-rays, my suspicion is we're looking at a growth plate fracture of the distal fibula. So that's a good trick you can do to sort of delineate and tease out where the patients are having pain. And then after you've done your palpation, you want to go to your provocative exams. So really, there's only two provocative exams that we're going to work on today. One is the tower tilt, and the other one's the anterior drawer. So for the tower tilt, you do it in plantar flexion, in neutral if you can get them in neutral, and then in dorsiflexion. So when we start in plantar flexion, here about 10 to 15 degrees of plantar flexion, and you tilt the ankle this way, if the patient has pain or instability, it's likely an anterior talofibular ligament sprain. There. Now we bring them up to neutral and inversion, and they have pain. It's a calcaneal fibular ligament sprain. Now, the same thing holds true when we come to neutral immediately and evert the ankle. Let me get my hand in there. And if they have pain, it could be a deltoid ligament sprain. And then, dorsiflexing the ankle and inverting could indicate a posterior talofibular ligament sprain. So you want to be sure that you're doing it in all three dimensions. So plantar flexion, neutral, dorsiflexion. Now you don't have to be 20 degrees of dorsiflexion. You don't really have to push them up. They're not going to want you to do that anyway. But it gives you an idea of where the sprain is. And then to test the stability of the ankle, basically uh, we do an anterior drawer. Now the best, play, the best way to do that is patient lying supine and bend their knee, but for illustration purposes, we're going to try to take, we're going to bend the knee up a little bit more and take the hamstrings and take the, uh, the uh, calf muscles out of the equation. And when we do an anterior drawer, and we'll demonstrate this in this plane, and then we'll demonstrate it from the anterior plane. Now, he's probably not going to have a positive anterior drawer because he's not unstable. But I'm going to do it the way I typically do it, and I'm going to move my hand so you guys can see it a little bit better. But you basically grab the heel, Use the tibia as your fulcrum, and you pull forward. Did that hurt? Look like it hurt. So you're in a little bit of plantar flexion here, and you pull forward. And you guys can sort of see on the video that he does have some translation. Now, most of that is skin, and I'm just trying to exaggerate to prove a point here. He actually has a little bit of translation. He's fighting me. He has a little bit of translation here. And then when you come anteriorly, you can see it. Now, when I move my hand, you maybe see it a little bit better. And then you get them like this. Relax for me, bud. Let it go nice and loose. There you go. And that's your anterior drawer. So those are your two provocative tests. Tower tilt, anterior drawer. Now, there's, I'm, I know from the PT and the ATC st standpoint, there may be a lot more tests that you guys do on the back end, and I'd like to hear about them in our discussion. Uh, but this is basically our ankle exam, how we do every patient every time. And again, I, uh, I didn't say this but on the exam, but I examined the other side first. Now, it becomes a little bit more problematic when they've injured both ankles, right? So you don't have a comparison view. And sometimes you may actually have kids who have ligamentous laxity. And when they do, you do an anterior drawer, and they're lax. And you go to the other side, and they're lax. You're, OK, we, we're, we're dealing with a uh, lax patient. All right, man. No cast for you today. You cool? Yeah? OK. Thanks, brother. Okay.
and now I'm going to open it up to questions. All right, I'll, I'll start with one. Uh, so um, you mentioned getting the uh, AP lateral and mortis x-rays for the ankle. Now, if a patient has tenderness over their navicular or their fifth metatarsal, will, will that be visualized on the ankle series? Great question. So I had a little bit of trouble fitting a round peg into a square hole for talking about an ankle exam without talking about a foot exam. But no, if, if they have pain at the navicular or the fifth metatarsal, I'd prefer three views of the foot, right? And I, I guess I didn't sort of touch on that simply because it leads us down an entire road of foot exam, which ankle and foot are an hour each. But sometimes you'll get an ankle and a foot if they have yeah. tenderness at the malleolus and the fifth yep. metatarsal, for example. So there's nothing wrong with getting an ankle and a foot. And I will tell you that sometimes you'll get an ankle or somebody sends a patient in with an ankle and you, you can sort of catch the fifth metatarsal on the ankle and you see a line, then yes, you go, you definitely go for a foot. I want to ask a question for our pediatrician colleagues about uh, what's the value of follow-up x-rays for one that's maybe equivocal, they have tenderness at the distrafibular physis or distal tibial physis, they're effectively negative, what's the role of follow-up x-rays, do they need them, when do you do them? Great question. So I typically do not do follow-up x-rays for non-displaced distal tibia or fibular Salter Harris 1 or 2 fractures because I, I don't think that it provides any benefit. Uh, the, the possibility of growth plate arrest for those injuries is less than 4%, less than 5 or 4%. So you're just exposing them to radiation and really there's zero outcome to it. I will tell you though that if a patient arrives back to me after immobilization for about four to five weeks, if they're still in discomfort or have swelling or something else, I may venture to get x-rays because then you could be looking at a chondral surface injury, an osteochondral injury, something that may not have um, been visualized at first. But most times those patients come back feeling fairly well, a little bit deconditioned and stiff from being in a boot or a cast. So to answer your question, no, I don't do those. Um, displaced Salter Harris II fractures of the distal tibia, I do those x-rays at follow-up, then they get x-rays at six months and sometimes 12 months to make sure that they don't develop a fice seal or, or growth plate arrest. So in the urgent care setting, how do I determine weight-bearing versus non-weight-bearing, crutches versus not? I, mean, I, I, would, I would say that um, if the patient can weight-bear um, and it, it, they do it fairly easily, then it's fine to let them weight bear. Um, but if they seem unstable or they just refuse to, then it's probably best, your stall would be to just, just don't let them weight bear. But again, in an urgent care setting, I, think it, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, okay, you don't need to weight bear until you follow up with a provider and see what's going on. Um, crutches versus non-crutches, I, I think it's a judgment call and how the patient feels. Uh, and if they, if they can tolerate walking in a boot, and I guess you guys probably splint most times, right? You got boots? So the question was, uh, in an urgent care, you know, would we weight bear or not weight bear? And I would say if you have boots and they can weight bear unencumbered, then I'd let them. Okay. Um, if you have an x-ray that shows a significantly displaced fracture, <laughs> please don't let them weight bear. But they're, not gonna, they're, they're probably not going to do it anyway. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay. There was another hand here. So if a, a young athlete has a uh, first time grade one or grade two ankle sprain and you come back for a follow up, parents are asking, should they wear an ankle brace going back to activity? Do you encourage it? What's your advice on that usually? So the question was, um, if a first time um, an athlete first time sprain or let's say growth plate injury, um, do I send them back with uh, immobilization of any kind? And I try not to. Um, I'd prefer they actually worked on a home exercise program and stabilized their muscles, tendons, and ligaments so they don't become brace dependent. Um, that being said, if they become more of a chronic type, I may give them a sort of, you know, a neoprene type brace. Um, uh, typically when I go out to, when my daughter used to play volleyball, I went out to volleyball games and I'd see girls just donning 
you know, gigantic figure of eight, lace up uh, bilaterally, and they're like, well, I just have, I have weak ankles. Okay, well, uh, work on that, right? Instead of, instead of supporting the weak ankle, you know, strengthen it. So um, I, I feel sometimes a family's going to do it anyway. So if you sort of guide them in a way of uh, less is best, the more stabilization you're putting on it for, an unstable, for a stable ankle, you're not really providing any benefit. Because you've probably seen in your own practice that even if kids have unstable ankles, you can put them in the best, tightest brace, and they will find a way to sustain an inversion injury through that brace. Because they're not, they haven't really addressed the initial issue. You know, there's, there's certainly a, a fairly high recurrence rate of uh, ankle instability and, and you know, a lot of the times the families are looking to get back fast. Um, and, and so, you know, we will sometimes send them back in a brace, especially in season, to provide a little additional yeah. stability while we're continuing to rehabilitate them because sometimes we have them back before they're 100% um, strong in terms of proprioceptive deficits and, and strength. They may not fully be there. So, so I'm, I'm comfortable sending them back in a brace um, if, if, they, if they need that. Um, you know, there's a lot of studies coming out looking at prophylactic bracing, and that's a whole other controversial topic. Um, you know, and if you're going to brace basketball or volleyball athletes, for example, who've never injured their ankle, um, you know, a lot of people are using bracing for that. And then if so, do you use sort of a lace-up brace or do you use one of the rigid braces like, uh, uh, um, you, you know, the, there's, there's different options out there like an active ankle brace um, or, or do you use more of a soft style brace? So, so there's a lot of data, I think, that we're trying to figure out kind of what makes sense is, is and, and if you're having bracing, you know, one of the concerns is, is there an increased risk of um, upper injuries? So, for example, is there an increased risk of translating that force up to the knee um, and, high, and maybe MCL injuries or other things that may come to come with that? Um, you know, another question we get a lot is taping. Um, you know, and, and so we'll, well, should I tape the ankle? Uh, and, and, you know, usually they'll ask, can I tape the ankle? And my first answer is you can try, but, you know, the athletic trainers have thousands of hours of experience doing that. But um, even, even a good tape job from an athletic trainer tends to loosen up after 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and so, so, therefore, the braces, they can readjust. So sometimes like a figure eight type ankle brace, like an ASO ankle brace, tends to provide pretty good support and stability. They can do it for practice without having to have an athletic trainer around. Um, and then can adjust it at halftime or between games or things along those lines. Um, while they're continuing to rehabilitate, I think that's the key that, you know, is, is they have to rehabilitate so that they don't have uh, a subsequent injury. And um, I think that's sort of because Shane's big on return to sports, right? And with the fractures and the sprains that we see, you know, in fracture clinic, we tend to try to see obviously more fractures and get the sprains over the sports, but sprains do come. And it's always a controversy of when, you know, okay, I'm, I'm healed, can I go back tomorrow? No, you're deconditioned. I, I, and I usually say, my, my gestalt is about seven to 10 days of a home exercise program and progressing with that with the trainers and, and then make, help work with the trainer to decide when you can return. I was just going to respond to your question about okay. uh, the, the recovery and how we kind of make decisions. and. Um, my thought is always we're just trying to uh, match their activity with their tolerance. Uh, we always explain like tissue healing times based on the tissue that's involved to give kind of the expectations to the patient. Um, and so, you know, if they have weight bearing issues, we're going to do a protective environment. We might do things like the anti-gravity treadmill or unloaded balance activities or maybe start seated instead of standing. Um, but the better we can kind of uh, meet them where they, they are and kind of give a controlled stress, uh, we're trying to get a response. We just want to make sure that we're not overloading. And so what, sure. what we want to do is just, um, you know, watch how they respond to the treatment, make sure that they're progressing and heading in the right direction, and then gradually uh, increase the loading. And then, of course, as we move into things that are more functional or sports specific, we're going to uh, test their motor control and balance and things like that as long as they're pain free. But I think the important thing to create a good healing environment is just match the activity with their tolerance and let them naturally respond and just make sure that the activity is pain free for the patient, especially when it's an acute injury versus chronic and it has more to do with tissue damage and protect, uh, protection and controlled loading. Perfect. Two minute synopsis. Okay. And I think that's all we have as far as time, Shane. Yeah. We have time for one more question, comment, discussion. I have a question from our online folks. Um, 
from a pediatrician standpoint, if you have a fracture in the ankle and a lot of swelling, um, sometimes uh, advice might be given to the family to wait a few days for the swelling to go down before coming to see you. Could you comment on that? Yes. So the question was uh, a fractured or even sprained ankle because, you know, uh, I'm assuming we're talking about a, an x-ray diagnosed fracture with a ton of swelling. And the, you know, the party line has been, well, see ortho in three to five days because of swelling. I'll tell you from a fracture clinic standpoint, from the sooner the better. So you don't have to wait those three to five days. We can cast a swollen ankle. Sometimes that swollen ankle may be a really displaced fracture that requires surgical intervention and may need a small reduction to actually get the joint back in a better position. And the longer that joint stays out, the more swollen it becomes, the harder it is to do surgery because you can't do ankle surgery on a really swollen ankle. So get them into us as soon as possible so we can make the determination on next action steps. Waiting three to five days is not a problem, but they don't have to wait that long to see a specialist in, in, in ortho. Okay. Great. Thanks, thanks, Ray. And thanks, Blake. And thank you, Blake, for uh, getting up so early this morning, too. Stand up for a round of applause for our, our model. Super early for him to get up this morning. So um, thank you guys for, for attending. I do want to just make a quick announcement about um, we have an upcoming uh, conference. So, you know, we, we do this every month, but, but every year we do our annual uh, sports medicine for the young athlete conference. Uh, this year it's going to be on Saturday, May 2nd. Uh, you see it there. It's going to be here uh, on the Frisco campus, and it is a full day session um, with uh, didactic sessions as well as breakout sessions interspersed. Um, so you can see a variety of topics. We're going to have some ethics um, uh, time on, on mental health and young athletes covering sleep, nutrition, concussion, um, casting and splinting complications. Uh, shoulder or, or I'm sorry, uh, knee exams and such. So we're, we're going to be covering a lot of different things. So if you have any interest, you know, let us know or please join us for that. Um, we are offering um, BOC credit for athletic trainers as well as uh, continuing education and I believe for PTs as well. So uh, Brandy can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, yes, thumbs up. So yes, continuing education for, for whatever background you're in. Um, and so please join us uh, uh, Saturday, May 2nd for Sports Medicine for Young Athletes. And we'll uh, hope to see you guys back next month for Coffee Kids and Sports Medicine. Have a good day.